Hello, hello, everyone. I'm glad to uh, be here with you all, and thank you for joining the um, uh, next uh, Lead In uh, webinar, which will be um, a system technology, mental health, and system technology in the workplace. Um, I have a special guest, um, Nora Delisle who will be uh, speaking about, talking about uh, different uh, technologies that is available for, um, for you know, workplaces to help with employees as far as their uh, mental health. I know I've seen um, just kind of a shift to uh, from employers and businesses making sure that their employees are, um, uh, you know, well, both, you know, physically and, and mentally. So I'm really excited to uh, have Norm here to uh, discuss um, some of the, the technologies. Uh, my name is uh, Tamika Sitches Spruce, and uh, I am the director of Lead In. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please put it in uh, the chat. If you're here on Zoom, um, also you can uh, comment on Facebook um, as well. And um, in a minute, if you would like to join us on Zoom, I will put the uh, Zoom link in um, on Facebook so you can join us here um, on Zoom as well. So uh, without further ado, I would like to bring in Norm Delisle. Thanks, Tamika. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, this is a, a new way of thinking about personal support, and there's a lot of things involved in it. I've tried to pick a handful of uh, areas to think about it. And I'm going to give you uh, access to specific free apps that uh, you can try out for nothing and on your phone or on your computers and tablets. And um, I've kind of formatted it as assistive technology for interdependence and personal safety, because from the perspective of the employee, that's, uh, those are the, the, the dimensions that they want to deal with competently when they're in an employment environment, even if they have still have symptoms from from uh, uh, mental health or um, uh, trauma. I am a person who's had uh, I was on the autism spectrum when I was a kid, and uh, the I have uh, trauma from that, and I also was a combat veteran, so I had trauma from that. And some of these are tools that I use uh, when I'm having symptoms so that I can uh, uh, am able to reduce them and maintain my focus on what's important to me in my life. Um, if, if you have any questions, as Tamika said, put them in the chat. If I can't get to them during the, during the presentation, I'll follow up and get them and respond to each one. One of the things that I added to this particular version of this presentation that wasn't here before is a part about artificial intelligence and the way in which it's changing a lot of things for people with disabilities, but most certainly for supporting people uh, in their employment. And to give you kind of a sense of the strengths and weaknesses of it, I asked um, ChatGPT to create a picture for me that would have um, a, a group of adults from diverse communities with mental health issues. And this is what I got. And the good thing is, is that it is diverse, um, uh, but as you take a close look at it, you can tell that it wasn't exactly a perfect picture. I asked it to put place these people in front of the White House. It did that. Um, but it is one of the things I've learned is, is that if you're looking for images of people with disabilities of any kind and you want them to be uh, doing something specific, it's very, very difficult to find uh, 
uh, images on image sites that allow you to be specific. So what we end up with really is a is kind of uh, pictures of people with disabilities, but pretty much empty of content. Um, that's just the way it is right now. I'm sure that all the image stuff will improve. Um, I think it. Uh, I think I've noticed even in the few months I've been doing it that uh, that that was that was the uh, that was the trend. The point of assistive technology for uh, people with uh, especially trauma related um, experiences is how do you how do you live safely and how do you maintain high quality social relationships, uh, especially in the work environment? And the, the fundamental principle is, is that personal control is personal power. You'll notice at the bottom of the page that there is uh, an address that goes to a resource page of apps and information. And these apps cover everything but the kitchen sink. There's an awful lot of them, but um, it's when you have the time, if you have a half an hour, it might be worth looking to see what strikes you as potentially useful to you. Today, I'm going to um, focus on three areas. One is assistive tech to support emotional self-regulation, assistive tech to support executive function, which are those skills we usually think of as important to work, and assistive tech to support personal safety. If you can uh, transform existing control methods over, over yourself and others, to supporting the person's genuine agency and choices through the use of assistive tech, you can reduce the need for ongoing complicated control-based interventions. And everyone, if you can do that, everyone will be a lot happier, I can tell you. Um, uh, I've always hated this, the slide pictures that asked questions. They were usually just a question mark. So one of the things I did was I, I asked the artificial intelligence to create a, uh, a room full of people who all had questions. And, and this is what it came up with. A lot of people um, quietly sitting and every single one of them has a question mark over their head. So I, I think that's more accurate. Um, Feel free to take care of your needs as they arise. And if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, also, if you run across an app that you think is a useful one to support recovery, let me know and I'll add it to the resources page. Uh, I still work for MDRC. Some of you may know me from a long time ago. I'm, I'm not really working full time. I'm working basically half time. Um, I like the work, uh, I'm, but I'm getting a little older and I don't have the energy I did. So I'm only working 20 hours a week. I have to tell you that I was never really very happy uh, with the MDRC mission and the new one that I'm very happy with. It says MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. Uh, that uh, is a much better statement than the one we used to have, which was mostly focused on uh, political presence. This mission is something that I believe, and I think everyone who works at MDRC believes it, and it's reflected in our work. It's not a marketing mean, it's a statement of purpose and a desire for allies. If you hear barking in the background, our dogs have learned to identify the engine sounds of all the major carriers of packages. So even if they don't stop in our driveway, even if they're just going by, they sometimes will start to bark at them. Assistive technology. It's any item, piece of equipment, software, or app that is used to help people with disabilities, including older adults, do what they want to do. Technology can make things easier for everyone. For people with disabilities, AT opens up wide possibilities. Not all assistive tech has to be an app. 
has to have a battery or needs to be plugged in. A lot of AT is low tech. Uh, there's a, a picture of a woman on this page who is using a, a pill organizer to set out her medication needs over a course of a week or so. There's also a, a, a man who is uh, put in a, um, a lever for his door instead of a no doorknob because he's got arthritis and it's much easier to use a lever than it is to rotate a, um, uh, a, a doorknob. That's, I think that's pretty much true for everybody, but it, if, every, if there were levers everywhere, it would be much easier to get around than it is now. And I also have a young man who is using a walker and using it to go and do his shopping um, without having any inordinate amount of delay or pain because he wants to do that. Um, in a very big way, AT can prevent falls just because you're using it. It doesn't have to be something that's focused on preventing falls. And uh, it has made a big difference for helping people move out of nursing homes and into their own homes. Now, when you're thinking about AT, I can tell you that um, it's astounding the, the level of devices and apps and other kinds of support that is out there now. And uh, since there was virtually none of the online or um, phone-based kind 15 years ago, all that stuff has happened very recently. Uh, so it's a good idea to think through choosing AT, especially if it has any cost. Uh, one thing you want to do is uh, start with your personal goal or the personal goal of the person you're helping. AT is not a one size fits all in any way. It requires a matching between the individual and all their capabilities and uh, the device or the app. And you'll, I think you'll see that when I start talking about apps more directly. You need to research the device and app options uh, almost any device currently available has a cheaper alternative. And price is a big issue, especially if there's not going to be any simple way to get a device. It's always wise, especially if you're going to be spending any money, to ask for a free trial. And when I talk later about the MDRC's AT demonstrations program, that's one way you can get a free trial on a device without having to pay anything for it and get some help in learning how to use it. You have to have a good understanding of the person's environment for the use of the AT and it's, and it's not immediately obvious. And all of us look at our environment as though we were gonna do something in it. So we don't necessarily understand how it is that an individual with a specific characteristic uh, interacts with that environment. So it's worth taking some time to learn that. Review the resources. You don't want to forget about these, financial, friends and family, set up an installation, programs that might help, warranties and repair. You, it's not so much that you have to have, for example, a place to take a device to get it repaired, but you have to know how to use it. And you want to avoid the problem that we had in the early part 20 years ago with uh, hearing aids, where you had, if they broke, you had to send them back to Germany to get them fixed. Um, we don't want that. We want to be able to do that and maintain the support we need and make choices the way we want to. These rules of thumb are really no different for, than they would be for any other important choice or purchase. I want to add, so here we are using remote conferencing. I want to add that this is becoming increasingly important uh, for everyone including our community. Um, mutual support and, and peer support have embraced remote interaction in response to the pandemic. Now that the pandemic is over and we've all learned that you can do pretty much most things you can do remotely if you have the tools to do it. So we're not gonna be getting rid of remote uh, support anytime soon. And I think we're probably going to get better at it as time goes on. 
And right now we're in a project that's uh, uh, going to require two organizations to work together. And we're going to use a combination of a largely remote with a, with a few in-person ones to maintain and build uh, connection and relationships. And I think it'll work very well. Um, lived experience itself, the thing that probably is the most important part of us sharing with one another and building trust and respect, um, it's universal and it's not tied to any particular way of connecting. It requires an effort to engage and learn and to uh, you build respect, you build trust through engagement. So that's what we really want. Mutual support is meaningless without inclusive accommodation because uh, remote communication technologies are always changing. The same thing will be true for our community. Disabled people must also constantly evolve so that we can make use of the tools that are available. The evolution is a real challenge for our community. People get used to doing things in a certain way. And I, I think everyone who's involved in AT has noticed that stuff that used to work perfectly well 10 years ago no longer exists. And people were very happy with it. And now they can't get a replacement for the one they had. We have to, we have to as a community, keep up with uh, um, uh, the changes that are occurring. And we have to share with one another as we discover things that work and don't work. The remote technologies are an important part of the environment in which we use any AT now. Um, we're gonna have to continue this search as long as we can. I've listed some tools like uh, remote conferencing, audio communication, texting and group support texting, Discord, Slack, and other asynchronous communication systems that use them in organizations. Uh, it's always worth checking to make sure that they're actually accessible to people because there's an enormous number of them. And, uh, but if they are, they allow for a type of uh, interaction that um, uh, eliminates, usually eliminates the problem of phone tag, um, which was always a problem. It didn't just become one recently. So there are always things out there to use, but it does require some work to find out um, which ones are useful and which ones aren't. Uh, plans of recovery are common in, in, uh, in our community. And uh, I have taken some time since recovery became part of the thinking of uh, Michigan uh, mental health and behavioral health services in the late 90s. And uh, I always thought that recovery uh, was a, a term that was chosen by the community of people with lived experience of severe mental illness or substance use disorder. But in the larger culture, recovery carries an implication of cure, which isn't really part of recovery. The way it's used by activists with lived experience involves shifting the responsibility for control from oppressive social and medical systems to personal control and environment of natural social supports, so family, friends, allies. Um, recovery in this framework can be of use to anyone with lived experience and not just members of the SMI community. And frankly, we, if, we are, if we engage with one another and we're, we're uh, open and listening, we can, uh, we can provide support to anyone who has a stated issue with trying to make the recovery go forward. And we are now doing uh, demos of sobriety apps, for example, for a detox program because uh, once people are past the, the medical detox, they, they are beginning to look, well, what do I do next? And um, we have a, a, a program where we've uh, provided a, the detox program with iPads and they've been loaded with apps that people will be able to use while they stay there. And I think that's a good model and we're gonna try to build one into a residential program too. But generally speaking, you don't need to have a program to make use of a support for recovery. Uh, traditionally, we've done that with other people who have the same issues, but there, uh, this can complement that. It can also substitute when people live in a place that's, that's not safe for them. It can give them uh, some opportunity to make choices that, uh, when they can't really depend on other people. 
Um, recovery is, in my view anyway, is the personal management of barriers to autonomy and free choice through effort, learning, habit building, effective ritual, natural supports, and the tools available through support systems, including AT. All right, let's see. The first issue is supporting emotional self-regulation. The larger system views emotional regulation as its primary way of controlling people who have mental illness. And that's why um, drugs uh, were introduced in the institutions in the, in the mid 50s and uh, why those uh, variations on those same drugs are still in use today. And um, I would not be a person who would say that there's never a reason to use a medication, especially if the risks of not using it are high. But the reality is, is that antipsychotic medications simply reduce your ability to do much of anything. And even as they gradually get rid of things like hallucinations, and they also, uh, one of the great lies to the general public is, is that all hallucinations are a sign of psychosis. Um, and I, I uh, uh, and I still remember from the 70s and the 80s that psychiatrists regularly told people that they should never mention that they had hallucinations because if they did, they'd end up being uh, forced into a hospital and forced into treatment against their will, which of course was true. But can you imagine being forced to never talk about, safely talk about, um, an important uh, process that's going on in your life because, of, because you might be uh, effectively imprisoned if you do? In any event, it's better to have emotional self-regulation where you use apps for emotional self-regulation. They've exploded during the pandemic. They allow for the building of rituals and habit managements and the accumulation of personal data about how you experience those symptoms, which can be, um, you can use it to increase your personal understanding of the emotions of lived experience. Um, I had a long, lifelong problem with depression and anxiety. Um, for a long time, I thought I had generalized anxiety until I, this is going to sound weird, but until I went to Vietnam and discovered that that anxiety, which I thought was generalized, was always going to be there, disappeared while I was in the combat zone. And I, that was so bizarre that I spent some time thinking about it and came to the conclusion that it wasn't generalized anxiety, it was social anxiety. And since there is really no social life in a combat zone, I didn't have the anxiety. And um, I think that using apps can allow you to look at those symptoms when you're not experiencing them and still get something useful out of uh, your view. All of them allow sharing, all these apps allow sharing. And with some are tied to clinical support if that's what you want. The newest tools are called neuromodulators or brain stimulators and they use uh, small amount of electricity to stimulate parts of the brain without having, you don't have to have your brain cut over it or anything. We have just begun, they have just begun to be uh, cheap enough that it's possible for us to buy them and we can offer them as a demo for people and we can loan them to people for short term use if they want to try it. I tried the first one we got, uh, it was designed to uh, promote focus, and it did that for a couple of hours. Um, it wasn't a miraculous, life-changing experience, but it did work. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few of the extraordinary number of apps that are out there. These are ones that with which we have some uh, experience. The, if you have to start with one app, the best one to start with is the Veterans Administration PTSD Coach. It's entirely free, although it started out as a response to combat PTSD. It didn't take very long for uh, them to understand that there were a lot of other things that fed into uh, PTSD and the symptoms and trying to manage it. And they now have uh, an app for uh, 
Android and app for iPhones. They have an online version, which I would recommend to you as the place to start because it's, it's easily accessible and it's complete. And you can get a sense of what you would want to use on your phone from going through the online version. They also have a family coach app for family members who want to uh, support uh, their, the person in their family uh, with um, trauma-informed interventions instead of blaming or, or criticism or, or further trauma. I also, every year they come out with these and I put in the one that was a mental health recovery support apps for 2023 as the latest one that was complete. And uh, there's a lot in there and they're, I think, I can't say for certain that they're all free, but I think they are all free. For those of you who've ever had any experience with uh, a cognitive behavioral therapy, I don't really have a problem with it as long as the individual's in control of it. I do have a problem with it if it's being imposed on somebody. But MindShift has a good, well-respected version that you can use on your own without the necessity for anyone to tell you what to do. And um, they have a, a, a decent system for both iPhone and Android or iPad. Um, and finally, because transcranial magnetic stimulation is so new, Mayo Clinic did an overview of it uh, um, it is not in any way, shape, or form is it, uh, is it uh, electroconvulsive therapy. It's a very mild process, and it lasts about, my experience was, is it lasted about two hours. I chose a task that I find tedious and I can barely do to test whether the focus actually improved my ability to do that particular task. It was the tutorials for a new um, uh, video game. I hate them. I hate having to drag myself through them. Uh, and yet it's hard to learn the basics of a game unless you do that. So I tried that and it did make it easier for me to get through. Um, there will be many more. There's a, going to be a type, I imagine, in the next five years where they use ultrasound instead of uh, electrical stimulation. I'm I suspect that many of you have at one time or another have had an ultrasound examination because of a, uh, of an injury or something like that. It's the same ultrasound, but it has the advantage of being able to pinpoint a specific spot deep in the brain rather than being at the surface like the current ones are. I Also, the current available devices are now around $150 or less. They used to be hundreds of dollars. Um, so I think that if you were thinking about trying it out, you're more than welcome to come to MDRC's AP program and have a demonstration on its use and see what you think of it. Uh, I think that I'll tell you what, what really struck me is the best thing about the VA PTSD coach when I first opened it up and started looking at it to see stuff that I might want to use. And what struck me was, is that they had a list of, uh, of symptoms and you'd pick a symptom and then you would find some tools and you could make some notes and that kind of thing. And the one that struck me was anger. When I was a substance abuse therapist in the seventies, anger was almost always an issue um, about somebody or something. When I was working with people, I had a lot of people who were court ordered for therapy. And I, um, I, it was really hard to find stuff that was of genuine use to people whose primary problem was anger. And that's a, a critical symptom in the VA PTSD coach. And one of the reasons why I would uh, recommend it as a, um, as a good place to start. Uh, all right. I have some images that I'm gonna go over quickly to describe them to you. Uh, the one on the far left is an individual who's using an app uh, with, uh, with uh, earphones at obviously at a college or some sort of facility where they're walking around in what appears to be a lovely setting. Um, and uh, that's, that tells you about the supporting recovery wherever you are 
part of that is having control of how you get and how you use information. And this illustrates uh, several ways that allow you to, to um, uh, support your own recovery without having to give up personal freedom to do so. The second one is the home page of the PTSD Coach Online. And uh, they have a, a great many resources available, not just symptom-based resources. They also allow you to fill out uh, forms and print them out. They don't store those forms. So if you leave, um, I mean, I think it's worth some time just filling something out, even though it's going to disappear as soon as you shut the site. But if you want them, you can print them out and use them for yourself. The, the little uh, square image down at the bottom is a, is a stylized picture of how uh, neuromodulation works. There's a little um, uh, electrode that doesn't work on its own. What they generally do these days is they take a little cheap, really cheap pad and put salt water in it to conduct the electricity. And then that goes in the electrode and you can dry those out and use them again if you want to. But the point of the diagram is, is that it produces change close to the surface of the brain. It doesn't go very deeply. The, the headphone thing looks like it's something out of Star Trek is, the, is a, one of the um, neuromodulation devices called Lifted. And it's, a, it's something you wear at the very top, of, right next to your hairline when you use it for a session. The sessions are 20 minutes. The whole process is automated. Um, I tried it on myself and now have a little more experience with a couple other people. Uh, everyone says that it, no, it did something noticeably. It wasn't staggering. It wasn't uh, life changing. Uh, nonetheless, it is a device and you put it on your head and you do send a small amount of electricity into your, across, the, across the skull. Um, there's uh, others out there too. We're going to try a couple more and see, I, I'm going to be the guinea pig for them. And um, uh, if they seem to do something, then we'll make them available to people if they want to try it. We require that people go through a demo so that they can understand what they're doing. None of these are hard to use, but there's certainly nothing about them that's intuitive. So it's better to go through it once, um, understanding the steps and understanding the limitations. And uh, we offer that for free. Those are free demos. Uh, so if you're interested, let us know. This last one is the CBT um, uh, uh, Mind Shift app. And uh, it's a well-designed, uh, uh, I don't have any problem with it. There are, there are also apps that uh, personally, for me, there's one called iBreathe, which is uh, I think both on iOS and uh, in Android that helps you to set up a routine for using breathing to, uh, to reduce symptoms. I, I use it if I wake up at three in the morning and every problem I ever had in my life is suddenly there and I can't go back to sleep. And it, it works effectively. It takes a, a little while to, to affect me, but it does work and I do go back to sleep. So I, I am a big believer in using breath to control symptoms. If, if you can get it to work, it's, it's cheap and you can use it anywhere. Also, um, I'll talk a little more about the demonstration uh, stuff a little later. Um, the next piece, which is really important in a work environment is supporting executive function. In fact, uh, my experience is, is that the uh, emotional self-regulation in a work environment often is because of difficulties with executive function and making it difficult to perform as well as you'd like to. Executive functions include focusing your attention, um, uh, work planning, time management, skills we associate with effective work. That's what executive functions are. The, um, even small children use their brains to support executive function. They just don't support, they just don't believe in executive function the way we do. Um, these uh, skills begin to expand dramatically in adolescence and they improve for decades. I used to think that there was a window and if you didn't improve your executive functions then you couldn't improve them at all. That just simply isn't true. Uh, but you do have to find a way to practice it. Um, 
and executive function is about solving personal and social problems, not for showing off on a test. Uh, it's, uh, the notion of what is effective uh, executive function is uh, uh, a result of our social and physical environment that we've constructed, not some intellectual version of the laws of physics. And it is well worth your while to uh, find simple, straightforward ways to improve your executive function. And there's a lot of apps out there that can actually uh, uh, help you do that. Executive functions and emotional self-regulation work together because they're interrelated and problems in one can cause problems in another. It's well worth having them both operating under your control and your learning. Um, here's some apps that support executive function. This, uh, this picture illustrates the, how much easier it is to get a picture that you can actually use about um, a device. I asked for a frog using a, 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 a letter board to communicate, and this is what I got. I don't know where the, where the fireflies came from. I guess the, the, the uh, image engine did that. Um, I, I'll tell you that uh, there are a lot of them out there, and certainly personal preference is a very important part of, the, of choosing something to support your own executive function, but you have a hard time finding something that's more generally useful than sticking with. Um, it, they can be physical ones, they can be an app, they can be, uh, you can stick them on your computer. The, a lot of, there are a lot of people who write sticky notes and stick them on the mirror so that when they get up in the morning, it'll be one of the first things that they see. Sticky notes are uh, a good tool for supporting executive function because they're very simple, they're very cheap, they communicate exactly what you want them to communicate, and they you can use them anywhere. You can use them in a hotel room, you can use them uh, during a conference, uh, you can use them on your, you can uh, paste them to your computer, do anything you want with them. Another one that's kind of uh, uh, produced enormously complex um, apps is to-do lists. There are a lot of simple ones. Um, I use, uh, I have a single list that I use in Google uh, Keep, which is a note-taking thing, one of the simplest, not very sophisticated ones. And I put everything on that list, food, stuff I wanna buy at a store, tasks I have to get done today, and then I just check them off. A lot of people would find that irritatingly uh, uh, overdone to have all those things in a single list. So there's no special way to do this. It has to fit you. Um, they even have, I don't think I've seen them in a long time, but they used to have a waterproof one you'd put in your shower and you could write stuff on it with a marker. And then when you went in to take your shower, you could see what it was you were supposed to do that day. You can use Alexa, you can use Siri, you can use Google Home, any of the speaker assistant apps all allow for you to do, set up to-do lists. And my sense is, is that one of the things that AI will do will make uh, using to-do lists simpler and deeper than what they are now. Basically, you put something down um, on there and uh, uh, if for some reason two or three days go by, you may have a hard time interpreting what you wrote down. So it may be that AI has some use in regard even to to-do lists, but to-do lists are entirely individual and it's well worth trying out several and not just accepting the problems associated with the first one that you try. Um, I mentioned that there are AI tools to support executive function. Uh, you can now use both Claude and ChatGPT for free. And Chat GPT just yesterday expanded what you can do with the free program. So I think it's worth your while to try out the free programs. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, the kind of issues you have. Um, if uh, uh, with AI in general, and you do have to be careful because it's not really organized to be absolutely certain that it tells you what you want to know. So you have to take control of it and make sure that it's something that you want. I was trying out the image 
creator for uh, chat GPT. And um, I, uh, I asked it, I wanted to give it a tough one. I, what I thought was a tough one. So I asked it to do an image of a, of a blind black woman who was using a white cane and crossing an intersection in New York City. And what I got was four pictures of black women with white canes crossing an intersection in New York City, but wearing a blindfold, which of course isn't what I asked for. So I had to go back and change it so that it, that it said um, a black woman who is blind. And then I got pictures I could actually use. Those, that kind of error, uh, the one you can't understand why the AI made it, is common in uh, AIs, and it's a good reason for playing with Claude and Chat GPT as free programs. All right, another important one, and again, one that's tied to both emotional self-regulation and, and executive function is supporting personal safety. Um, my my way of thinking about this, and it's been this way for my entire adult life, is that parental and authority-based models of imposing safety um, uh, automatically produce sabotage and rebellion, even, even if it's only in small amounts. And it undermines personal agency, not just for the thing that those systems are trying to control, but it undermines personal agency generally. So I don't think it's the best way to go at all. Personally motivated steps to ensure personal safety work best in the long term because they are a part of you and they are useful to you. And you don't have to, uh, I stopped behaving the way I did in the army the day I left the army. <laughs> and uh, it was because it was always done to, I always behaved in order to be safe in that environment. And, uh, uh, I never bought into the notion that they had the right to tell me what to do. Um, uh, the two things that tend to produce parental and authority-based models are dangerous behavior and, and SUD. And um, we've come to an understanding in the old days, it was uh, throwing you into the lake without a life vest with the approach to SUD. And, and dangerous behavior. And if you survived, you survived. And if you didn't, you didn't. I'm not a, I, I, I think it's best if the individual has gains control over whatever it is that's producing these issues for them. But at the same time, um, I think that harm reduction is an important strategy to support personal safety. And it should always be a part of, uh, I think that a lot of employee, um, uh, support programs in organizations have come to understand that harm reduction is an important tool for uh, supporting people. Uh, and um, I think that's good because I, I, uh, I don't think there's any evidence at all that punitive measures actually reduce uh, long-term dangerous behavior or substance use disorders. Um, let's see. I, I do have one thing, and I don't know whether this is, you'll run into this in your work in organizations, but um, there's a, there has always been a problem with the use of drugs in the uh, intellectual and uh, uh, developmental disability community. And um, it's as people be, got more freedom, I noticed I worked in substance abuse for some years in the 70s. I noticed that people would have obvious alcohol problems and nobody was uh, thinking about them or doing anything about them. And it was, I came to the conclusion that it was partly a, 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 a miss. It was, it was the belief that if you, if you tried to uh, tell a person with a uh, with a developmental disability they shouldn't drink, that you were undermining their freedom, and I would agree with that. But that to me, harm reduction is still an issue that we can use for people that uh, that um, have lost a significant amount of control over their drinking, especially if they're people that we like and consider friends. 
So I don't think we should simply ignore it because the individual is part of the IDD community. I also know from my time as a substance abuse therapist that the, the programs, the 12-step uh, the programs and uh, similar well-structured and complete programs um, are not designed for people who don't have good language skills and that you need to have a, uh, an approach that respects uh, communication uh, capabilities and addresses the needs that that specific individual runs into in their life. I had a number of individuals who had severe learning disabilities and, um, and they none of them did well. They all did great when they were in residential programs that were 12 step, but as soon as they got back to the community, uh, they began to lose contact with the meaning of it. And I always thought there should have been a better way to support an individual over the long run that actually accommodates their disability. Uh, am I doing this? I'm just gonna, I guess I'm doing all right. Are you doing good? Okay. Um, there are apps that support safety and I tried to list ones, not just the obvious ones for us, one specific community, but the general thing. Uh, if you live in uh, you live in out county Ingham County, there's going to be storms coming through, and they're they're not going to get a whole lot of warning about them. So I signed up for something uh, through Everbridge for Ingham County, and now I get notices when there's uh, problems on the highways and accidents and uh, and the dangerous situations and fires and that kind of stuff. And to me, that's important. I want to know that when I'm out there trying to get around. I also found a decent article on the best weather apps for 2024 that covers most hazards. There are some good personal safety apps. I, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, the, frankly, the best one of all of them is uh, something called the Tech Safety App website. And uh, it should be listed in the best personal safety apps. This is a a site that was developed originally to support uh, women who were uh, dealing with domestic violence. And it does that, but it also um, has become a resource for the problems that are still there and you still have to deal with when you're no longer in the house where the abuse was taking place deals with stalking, it deals with various attempts by an abuser to regain control, it deals with a great many things. And all of those are applicable to any community who is experiencing personal safety issues. So um, also there, there are a small number of people who have problems with weather because of the, it has a greater impact on their physical experience than it does on other people. And so they have another reason for wanting to know if it, uh, they don't want to get rained on their body, they don't want to be standing out in the heat, unable to get uh, water and uh, shade. There's a lot of things related to the weather that can impact people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. The one that I thought was the best online one is called the Tech Safety App website. And I would suggest to you that you take a look at it because it, it has a remarkable range of tools and ideas for how you can protect yourself. And we all need help with protecting ourselves online these days. This next one is, uh, although it was originally developed for people with developmental disabilities, I think it's useful to anybody who has uh, experienced uh, chronic abuse and who to whatever extent has come to expect it to be a part of their life because they deserve to be abused. And it, it helps people to identify and report the abuse in a straightforward way that begins to break through that notion that I, I deserve to be treated this way. And it's a very well developed. Uh, they market it to people with developmental disabilities, but I can tell you that if you, uh, there are plenty of people who could use it as a part of their recovery in a part of their safety plan for dealing with abuse. And I stuck this last one in because occasionally people hear this, um, using a personal safety app doesn't make you paranoid. It's, it's worth reading uh, and it's true.
Um, summing up, <clears throat> big thing to remember is that no technology ever solves a human problem by itself. Um, we are human beings, we are not machines. So replacing our parts is not a, not a way to solve a human problem. The technology should be viewed like a scaffold, like you were gonna build a house and you had uh, scaffolding around it that allowed you to work on the house. Um, but you don't live in the scaffold. The scaffold is a way for you to solve your problem. It's not the solution. And uh, when a person uses an app, they are engaged in support ecosystem. There are other apps, there are other people who use those apps, there are other people who use different ones. And remembering that, that it's not just you using the app, but it's also uh, the, all the things that we all share on, online that are potentially not going, that can be used against us, they're not necessarily going to be used against us, but uh, the ingenuity of predators is endless. Uh, there are always more possibilities out there than you know, and it's important to keep that in mind when you're using an app. The app is only there to support you. It has no other meaning or purpose. Um, and the last thing, because I think it's true, it's especially true, I think, for chronic illnesses, but it's actually true for any community where oppression, trauma is a, has been a part of individual personal history. There are always a bunch of people out there trying to solve similar problems to yours. And uh, don't think of an app as a hammer. Uh, think of it as a, 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 a hammer to pound in a nail outside in a raging blizzard at below zero temperatures. You need to know where the hammer is, but you also need a lot of other things if you're going to actually. Uh, there are no simple solutions to any human problem. The need for person-centeredness is just as great in finding an effective app as it is in choosing a support person who helps the individual every day. Both of these are equally complex and demanding. I wanted to tell you that I had mentioned this earlier. We we will we have a lot of devices. We uh, I think we must be up to around 1,500. We uh, we are willing to come out and show you how to use something. We can. We can do that with an iPad. We can bring an iPad out to show you how to use it. We do a lot of demonstrations with uh, with apps, but we also do them with equipment. My personal favorite is that we have a wheelchair accessible um, ice shanty for doing ice fishing in the winter in the UP. And uh, it's quite impressive. Um, there's a form to fill out. Uh, there's no cost to it. Um, if we don't have the device, but it seems like there's a way for us to actually get it. We'll get it. So there's links in the in the uh, in the PDF version of this presentation, but you can also go to the MDRC website and you'll be able to sign up there. Um, I also have some links in the slides. So that was smarter than I understood. Uh, we want you to fill out an application for it, not because we're going to refuse you, but because we need to uh, pull together how we will actually do it. And we can come to your place to do that, or we can do it in our office, or we can do it in a, in a, in a place that's convenient for, for both of us. Um, there's some information about stuff that I do. There's a lot of resources. Uh, uh, it's worth your while when you have a little extra time to look through them. You can always learn something. And if you have any last questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I see that there are some. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, and thank you for the opportunity. This is a nice opportunity. This is the first time I've had a chance to include, really include AI in the discussion of this. I intend to do more with it. Yes, yes, yes. All so right, I'll, I'll stop the share here. There we I go. Thank you, thank you, Norm, for uh, coming out and you know, sharing all the wealth of uh, resources. Um, and so I will uh, share this presentation with uh, all of those who registered today. And I'm in the midst of putting uh, 
a survey in the chat. So we love okay. to hear your uh, feedback and um, about this presentation. And also you can sign up to uh, the, uh, you know, you have access to our all of our other trainees uh, that will be coming up um, in the near future. So uh, thank you very much. I will put the link in the uh, evaluation to the chat and uh, please fill that out before you leave. But thank you very much for everyone for coming out and we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.